you know, I think I've seen all these faces in the Teach Center. I am the director of the Teach Center. And uh, we're here today to hear one of our most distinguished faculty members, <laughs> Dr. Beth Day Harrison. Uh, she is program coordinator for the special education program, uh, undergraduate and graduate. Do I have that right? <laughs> Among her other uh, accomplishments. I remember when we started um, our um, professional skills and diversity seminars back in 2006, Dr. Hairston was one of the first faculty members to volunteer <laughs> to uh, bring these special trainings uh, to our students. And we also invite some of our school colleagues to come to these as well. She is well known within the university family as well as our school partner family because she has done so many wonderful things. Uh, one thing about Dr. Harrison is that you know that when she stands before you in the classroom, you know you're getting real world experience because she stays in touch with the schools. Um, I, I, I was going to tell something on you, but I'm not. <laughs> I just, I, I decided I not to do it. <laughs> It's not that bad, but, <laughs> but I won't do it. But she does stay in touch with the schools. She knows what's going on so that when she tells you something, she really knows what she's talking about. She knows the context that it belongs in in the schools so that when you get out, you know what to do with your kids at this moment. She's not teaching you something that she learned in school when she was in school years ago. <laughs> and anyway, Dr. Harrison and I are about the same age, so I can, <laughs> and I tease her about that too. Yeah. I may be a year or just two. Just a year. Just a year. A year yeah, old. Okay, a year. okay. I won't even put that second. I'm just a year older than she is. But um, Dr. Harrison, in addition to being one of the best faculty members we have, uh, she has served on the National Council for Exceptional Children and the Council for Children with Behavioral Disorders. She's received numerous awards and honors outside of the university and the academic field, uh, such as the Wachovia Excellence in Teaching Award for WSSU, the School of Education Young Alumni Achiever of the Year Award from WSSU, and Teacher of the Year Award for Lawrence Middle School. So without ado, I know all of you know her intimately and have probably slaved over assignments that she has given you, but you've been a better person because of it, and you'll be a better teacher because of it. I present to you today, Dr. Beth Day Harrison. Well, thank you, Mr. Paul. I appreciate that. Thank you for that warm introduction. And good afternoon, young people. Um, good afternoon. <laughs> as uh, Mrs. Farrar said, I'm Beth Day Hairston, and we're going to be talking today about differentiated instruction. And I actually haven't taught everyone uh, in the room, probably most of the people on this side, and maybe one or two people on that, one person on that side. Uh, but just uh, so that you um, know what you're getting, I think Mrs. Farrar did a good job explaining uh, background information, but I love teaching. And um, I'm very passionate about teaching, and I want you all to be the very best teachers that you can be. I knew I wanted to be a teacher ever since I was eight years old, and I had my own classroom in the house. My mother was a teacher. So it was just destined that I was going to be um, in the teaching field. But when I first uh, started teaching, I started uh, in Wake County in a school uh, that just had children with disabilities in it. They had severe uh, behavior problems, and their behavior problems were so severe that they didn't have a school psychologist at the school. They had a school psychiatrist, a medical doctor, that helped us work with the children. That's just how severe these behavior problems were. And so I was at a special day school, and I have taught at a self-contained resource room, the regular classroom, and inclusive classroom. So I've been in just about, taught just about every disability, and um, taught at the middle and high school level, and elementary um, experiences. So um, I just have a vast number of experiences to bring to the table. And my research interests include co-teaching, differentiated instruction, inclusion, service learning, and working 
uh, with families of children uh, with disabilities. So I bring all that background, and um, as Ms. Farrar said, spent a lot of time in the schools. In fact, this is a picture of me uh, during Black History Month with my own child, who's in the middle um, there, and I'm at his school. I recite Langston Hughes poetry. So I actually, um, the teacher invited me in, and we had food. Believe it or not, the teacher asked me, uh, they were studying, uh, it was second grade, he was in second grade at the time, and they were studying about um, uh, Harriet Tubman and wanted to know what, what African Americans ate during that time period. And so she asked me that question and, um, and wanted to know, so I brought food. I don't know if that's what they ate during that time. I didn't know I was an expert in what uh, people ate during that time. But I just uh, included that in my um, presentation, and so I made black eyed peas and collard greens and fried chicken and macaroni and cheese and, and recited Langston Hughes poetry. So I'm not really sure if that's what they, that's a lot of food, but I'm not sure. And it's all unhealthy, <laughs> but I'm not sure if that's what, um, what they actually ate. But that just gives you a little uh, background about uh, who I am. Our presen my presentation does go until 6 o'clock. Um, we'll kind of figure out if we need a break or not while I'm um, talking. But the essential questions for today um, include what is differentiated instruction and how does it impact student learning? Uh, how can teachers provide an enriching learning environment for all students? And how can I incorporate differentiation into my own classroom practice? So those are the three things. You ought to be able to answer those questions when you walk out the door. And not only should you be able to answer them, you should be able to do something as, um, as a result of answering those questions. So, how many of you have ever heard of differentiated instruction? What is it? Tailoring instruction to meet the needs of children. Oh, good, a former student. Yeah. <laughs> you were in my class. Uh, you know, you make it kind of hard for the other students, and so, uh, but at, I mean, that is just, the, that is the perfect answer. But what happens is that uh, frequently you can't carry it out. You can say it, but when you get into the classroom, actually differentiating instruction becomes a problem. So since we have this perfect answer to it, what, what would it look like in the classroom? See, see it's harder to answer that question. But that's what, that's what we're going to design to talk about. But go ahead. What might it look like? Maybe tiered instruction. Oh, see, you're using words that not many people would know that, that we know. But yes, it would be tiered, and we're going to show examples of what that looks like. What else might it look like? It's good you can't answer the question. I see some student teachers in the room. And it's good that you can't, and I see some preclinical uh, students. So it's good that you can't answer the question, because then I don't, now I don't have to go home. I can, I, I've assessed the room. And I've assumed that you may or may not have that much information. But one of the things that's on your table is something that says yes, no cards. And they're colored. There might be yellow, there might be pink, and there are a lot of things that are around the table. And so you want to look for um, some cards that have yes, no. And the people around your table, if you would take one of those cards, please because I'm going to be assessing you, because that is something in differentiated instruction that we have to do regularly is assess. So hold up your yes no card, if there are enough around the table, just hold those up. And we're just going to try and see if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, are you ready to go home for spring break? <laughs> no? You don't let me go? I don't get to the hub side. She's a 12 month. You're not ready to go home? You don't get it at the end of March. But are you ready? Are you ready? Is, is pretty much. Okay. All right. Are you glad to be here today? Do you want to learn about differentiated instruction? All right. What did I just do? I assess. And I have to assess regularly before my lesson, during my lesson, and after my lesson. So on the table, you're going to find a number of things that we're, I'm going to be assessing all along. You shouldn't go through a 30-minute lesson with students and not know where they are. So somewhere, you've got to be assessing to figure out where they are. 
So that's one of the things that makes up a differentiated classroom before I get ready uh, to kind of share a little bit about what it is. So <clears throat> just in just some bullets, and then I'll show you a definition of what differentiated instruction is. It adapts what we teach. And what does adapt mean? Adjust. Adjust. Change. Readjust. All right? So it adapts what we teach, how we teach, how students learn, and how students show what they've learned. That's what differentiated instruction should do. And it's based, and when that happens, it's based on where the students are. Are they above average on this skill set? Do they understand? Do they not understand? Are they our AG children? Are they our, our, our children with disabilities? Are they just our average students? Are they struggling readers? But where is their ability level, their interests, and their preferred learning modes? And we have to meet students where they are. And that's often, that's what we don't do a lot of times. We don't, we don't know where our students are. So differentiation is a teacher's response to the student. So if a student is not understanding a concept, or if a student is, uh, we need to pre present a variety of approaches to make sure we're meeting the needs of all of our students. And at one time, people thought differentiation was just for academically gifted students. But it's for all students. It's not designed necessarily for whole group instruction. But it is designed to help students better have access to the curriculum and find additional ways to help them to be successful. Uh, it's the recognition of students' varying background, knowledge, and preferences. It really helps when you are able to feed on um, their background knowledge, the things that they already know and are bringing to the table, and then embedding those into what it is that you're doing. And it has to appeal to students. You know, you have to have learning that is exciting. And we're competing, what just came out today? Technology-wise, what came out today? The iPad 3. Now I just have, a, I had an iPad 1, a 2, and now I got to invest in the 3. We're competing with kids that have iPhones in elementary school. iPads, what else do they have? Every, everything that's out there, these little kids have. And so you're going to stand up and present a dull presentation to some kids that when they get home, they're more entertained by the computer than you. So we have to bring our game on. Now, I'm not saying you have to have a dog and pony show, but you need to be darn close every day to a dog and pony show that addresses Common Core, meets the needs of the students. But it has to be engaging and exciting. Uh, so, a definition that will, uh, is kind of long, I, I, I presented it to you in bullets, but this is what a definition might look like for differentiated instruction. And the part that's in red is, of course, the most important piece of it. And you have at your table uh, not the full PowerPoint presentation, but it is the full point, uh, PowerPoint, but it's in bulleted form, and it's in a narrative form, because I've had previous students that tell me that they've been to other workshops, and they've seen the PowerPoints in the workshop that they've been in other places. So I don't actually give people my, whole, my, um, my full PowerPoint. But anyway, a way of teaching in which teachers proactively modify the curriculum, the teaching methods, the resources, the learning activities, and the student products. Those things in red, those are the things that ought to look different in your classroom. You're going to have to create a variety of approaches based on those things in red um, to address the needs of students or small groups of individual students so that their learning is maximized. So if you don't make these changes, then students might not be getting the information that it is that they need to be successful. So I like to kind of look at visuals. I have about two or three visuals to kind of get you started before we do some hands-on about what differentiated instruction is. So just if you just had to look at this with no words, um, we have to, as teachers in a differentiated classroom, is adapt our classroom strategies. We've got to make some changes in how we're teaching. But in making presenting these changes, we have to look at the student's interests. What is it that they need? What is it that they like to do? Well, there's only one way to figure that out. You can't just look at them and figure it out. You're going to have to ask them questions. You're going to have to create some type of assessment so you can see what it is that children enjoy doing. 
Um, you ha it has to be challenging because it has to meet your children that are your highest functioning children. But at the same time, you want your students to be successful and you want them to have a level of satisfaction um, in what it is that they're doing. It needs to be meaningful. So that is kind of like a visual without all the words of what differentiated instruction is. So teachers are able to, or in a differentiated classroom, teachers can differentiate the content, they can differentiate the process, and they can differentiate the product. And we talk about the content, we're talking about what it is that students learn. What is it that you're presenting them? The, the information, for instance, like Common Core, we're going to have to really adjust to meet the needs of, of students. So, we can differentiate our content, what it is that we're teaching. We can also uh, present our process. We want this stuff to make sense to our students. So we've got to figure out how can I make this work so my students understand. I might have to do visuals. I might have to stand and do a dance on top of the table to get them to understand the concept. But you have to break it down for students to be able to understand because you're meeting all these levels of students. You've got to meet your lower functioning students, your average, and your high functioning students in a classroom with one lesson. So take for example, I had an apple. And in, with this apple, I have four groups in my classroom, because there are four tables pretty much here. And I, would, I want to come up with some activities for, this, for develop, uh, talking about an apple in an elementary classroom. So what, what's something I could talk about apples? What could, I, what could I teach children about apples at the very basic? Just think about the very basic skill set of apples. The same. Yeah. Color, shape. the fruit, shape, texture, anything else, a little higher level? What, what happens with the seeds? Okay. What about this level? You could incorporate math by cutting sections. So we can talk about fractions, all right? So I have this group that could be, we're talking about apples, but this group, I created activities that this group can do. This group can focus on fractions. How would you figure out fractions? I mean, what would you do to, how, using an apple, and how do you do it? And all right. And what divide? Divide. 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 Yeah. All right. And then I could split it up and give it to students. And what could students do in small groups with, those, with that? Could they shade? Could they? What, what are some things that they could do, perhaps? Could they do any research with a kind of average? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A science project. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, you all a little higher level. What could you do? Letter recognition. Letter recognition. What else? Could you do a little research about apples? Could you go online? Mm -hmm. But could these other groups have found some things online, too? But what, to what degree might you do research? All right, very good. Now you all are my brightest class in here. So, <laughs> by default anyway, right? Even in classroom? I hope nobody else is in our class. Uh, what else could we do? The highest level, what could you do with students with that? Just an apple, that's all we're talking about. Recipes, all right. And that has math in it. Measurement. Could you find out that some groups who might like yellow apples, green apples, and red apples, and you can make a graph. All right, keep, you see all the possibilities? Our mind has to, we need to stretch that far. We have to think outside the box when we're differentiating instruction. And so that's my process. I have to figure out how am I going to get my babies to understand about apples. And I might have to struggle all night. But my mindset is looking at three groups of students. But if you develop your lesson to meet the needs of those different levels, you're gonna, you're, they're going to get it. I guarantee you they'll get it if you take the time to figure that process out. And then teachers can differentiate the product, that end thing. And that's what we're going to talk about. What is it that you're doing so that students can understand that particular information? And when you differentiate content, process, and product, you have to do it according to where the, the, the readiness of the students, which I just kind of visually, that my lower functioning, my kind of next to low, my average, and my higher functioning, that's their readiness. I ha also need to know what do they like? What do they enjoy doing? If I have a student that, students that are really into race cars, 
What might be some of the activities that I might do in my class? Make them build one. They find the measurement. We're still doing math, but we're trying to find some way to help them understand the concept. Force and motion, yes. Speed. You can actually, we have a motorsports program here at Winston-Salem State University. So while you are out in the field and you really wanted to do something like that, you could find a faculty member that might come and help and work with the kids. You've got to think outside the box. That's interest. And then we have to figure out, well, how they, how they learn best. Are they visual learners? Are they tactile learners? Are they kinesthetic learners? That's how we have to figure out our <laughs> students. Visuals, we're going to apply these things um, in a few minutes. So why differentiate? Well, all kids are different. That's why we have to, is everybody the same in this? Look at us, do we look the same? I know you all don't look like me. So we are all different. And so you've got to think of ways to differentiate in your classroom. You just look at the big first part of that word, different, and come try to figure out what are some different ways that I can help my students to be successful. One size does not fit all. You can't go in there anymore with just one lesson. You've got to be able to modify and adapt that lesson to meet the needs of all your students. And differentiation provides all students with access to all information and content. So, you all are in the schools. You're, um, you, some people are doing their student teaching. Some people are doing coursework. H have you seen, dif based on what I just explained, have you seen differentiation at work in the schools, and if you could give an example of something that you've seen, and do not use me as an example. Anybody? For, for our classroom, what we do is during workshops, like reading workshops, we group kids in low, medium, and high levels. The higher level students are, they work more on their own. We can just give them a prompt or, you know, a card with an activity on it, and they're able to handle themselves and then the teacher usually works with like the middle level students and then we'll have someone else to come into the classroom to help work with the lower level students so that's one of the ways that they do it during workshop time. And on a scale of 1 to 10 how does that work for you? I think it works great especially for those lower levels because okay. they're a smaller group and so they get more one-on-one -on -one attention. And we're going to look at how we can differentiate and we don't have to pile high and deep. And they actually have things that different levels can do that you kind of have to think through prior to going into the classroom. But good example, OK? Was your hand up? No? Oh, OK. I can't answer you more. Well, I'm in student teaching, so I have to learn how to do this. But for example, I had a lesson on the layers of the atmosphere. And for the high learners, I just I was, we went through the different steps. But for the low level, they came up with a song about the different layers of the atmosphere and it helped them to understand well in the troposphere the weather happened so they had to come up with a song and right great and some of the things that's a, that's an example and what we'll talk about later is that differentiation doesn't have to be the same remember one size does not fit all if you're going in there with one lesson you're not differentiating instruction if you're teaching to the whole class you're not differentiating instruction so we're going to kind of look and see what, what, what just a, a, I'm going to tell you a story about what differentiation looks like. And on your table, um, you have a picture. And if you would hold up, since you had it in your hand, you can hold it up. And you don't have to do anything. You're right there. So hold up your, your picture. So there's a bike, there's a bus, there's a train, and there's a plane. And so just hold it up, because you're my prop, so I need you to stand up. I did say you didn't have to do anything, but you, do. you don't have to say anything, all right? So you're holding up your pictures, and um, I'm going to start with this group. We're going to Disney World. You ever been to Disney World? Yes. What's your favorite place in Disney World? Uh, Magic. Magic Kingdom, all right? So we're going to Magic Kingdom. Uh, we're going to arrive there next weekend, next week after spring break, all right? So to get to Magic Kingdom, and the dean is in the room, and he's sponsoring our trip to uh, the Disney World, Magic Kingdom, and you have a three-day pass, okay? So 
On our way to get to Magic Kingdom in Disney World, this group is going there by bicycle. <laughs> so they're eventually going to get to Magic Kingdom. They're just not going to get there as fast as some of you are. All right? Then our next fastest group is going to be the bus. Now, how many people want to travel by bus to Disney World? No. no? All right. But some of our students have to get there by bus. Some of this table is going there by bus. You're going to be a little faster than a bicycle. But eventually, you're getting to Disney World, and we will meet you in Magic Kingdom. Next, we have the train. Now, would you like to be in the train? That's not bad, go on my train to Disney World. OK, especially since you're not paying for it. The dean's paying for it. So this group is getting to Disney World by train. Now, over here, this is who I'm going with. I'm going to Disney World with this group right here, because they're flying. They're flying, first class. Dr. Vargas said I could go first class because many of the people around the room, they're not special ed majors at this table, but they do have a second course of study in special ed, so we're connected in some way. All right? So we're going by plane. Thank you very much. Have a seat. Now, does it matter? It doesn't matter if you get there by bicycle, bus, train, or plane. We're all, this is how you have to think about differentiating instruction. Your children, we're all going to Magic Kingdom and we're going to get there next week. It doesn't matter if they're low functioning, average, or high functioning. Our end goal is to get to Magic Kingdom. Your job is to help them get to Magic Kingdom based on content, process, product, based on their 